The Old Testament reading is from Deuteronomy chapters 4 and 6. Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the decrees that I am teaching you, and do them, that you may live and go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of these peoples, who when they hear all these statutes will say, Surely this great nation is wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? Whenever we call upon him, and what great nation is there that has statutes and just decrees so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The epistle readings is from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore having fasted on the belt of truth having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all preservation, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the seventh chapter. Jesus called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that, by going into him, can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the, inside, from the outside cannot defile him? since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and ex is expelled. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. From within, from out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. 
This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Back to school shopping is an annual tradition for parents all across this country. Some of you might have just wrapped up your back to school shopping. For others of you, it's been a while since maybe you've had to do that. But perhaps you take your grandkids out to pick out a new outfit before school starts. You see the flyers come in the mail, and there's crazy deals on everything from shoes and clothes to pens and paper. And why do we do back-to-school shopping exactly? Well, because we want our kids to be equipped, right? This is the idea. I want my kids, when they show up to school, to have everything they could possibly need. You might think 10 or 12 or 15 pencils is enough, but you just never know. You don't know what might be awaiting them. We want them to enter the school year looking and feeling good with all the supplies that they're supposed to have that are laid out in the back-to-school packet. We pour over the list they get from their teachers. We make sure everything is in stock at home, and if it's not, we have to go and, and stock up. Maybe fight the crowds at Target to fill in the gaps. In the end, we want our kids to start the first day of school ready for anything. Clean new clothes, nice new shoes, a fresh haircut, and more mechanical pencils in tow than any human being could ever possibly use. We do this, why? Because we want to give them every chance at success. If there's uh, an obstacle or a stumbling block that we can control, we want to eliminate it. They're going to encounter all kinds of things that we can't control, right? And we don't necessarily know what all those things might be. But pencils, I can control pencils. I can make sure they have enough pencils. And so that's what we do. With our kids, we understand how important it is to equip them properly for school, What about their spiritual lives? Do we give the same care to equipping them in that area? And even if you're not in school anymore, you're constantly confronted with situations that call upon you to be spiritually grounded and focused. Do you have the supplies you need? Are you equipped? Next Sunday is Rally Day, and we're going to be kicking off our educational programs for the fall. You're going to hear about Kids Sunday School and also Adult Sunday School. And this morning, I want you to think about your own participation in these programs. So for adults, we're going to have four classes going at once. I'll be teaching a class called Discover Grace, which is a class that's kind of intended for people who are new to the church or interested in joining the church, but anyone is welcome to come if you'd like a refresher or have questions, and it's kind of got two different goals. One is, you know, learning basic Lutheran doctrine, and the other goal is getting you oriented to our congregation and and plugged in where you need to be plugged in. We also have three other classes going. We have a class on Lutheran doctrine and tradition. We have a class about the hard sayings of Jesus, and also a class called Jesus in Genesis, so Old Testament, New Testament doctrine. Is there anything in there that you could learn in any of those classes, or, or do you have it all figured out. If you have it all figured out, please talk to me after class because we're always looking for teachers. Because guess what? Even having it all figured out doesn't get you off the hook, does it? It just gives you more work. So congratulations. We're going to put you to work. 
This morning, we're going to look at the epistle reading from Ephesians 6. St. Paul tells us to put on the whole armor of God. And so the question for us to ask is, how's our armor looking these days? Armor? Pastor, what are you talking about? I work in an office. It's air-conditioned. We just got a new water cooler. What do I need armor for? Well, St. Paul answers that question. Look at the beginning of our text. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Hmm. So every wrestling match I've ever seen has been flesh and blood, right? Paul's saying there's something else going on. There's a different type of warfare, a different type of battle that's being fought. When we outfit our kids for school, when we put on our own clothes for work, whatever they might be, we are preparing to wrestle against flesh and blood, aren't we? But Paul says that when it comes to our spiritual preparation, when it comes to our Christian faith and putting on the whole armor of God, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood anymore. This new battle is on a whole different level. Our battle is now with the rulers with the authorities, with the cosmic powers of this present darkness and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Our battle is now with the rulers and the authorities. But that must have just been a thing back then, right? We don't have to deal with that kind of thing anymore, right? Wrong. That battle is still going. St. Paul lays it out for us clear as day. So the question this morning is, do we believe him when he says that? When he describes this spiritual battle that's going? When he describes this battle that's uh, against the the spiritual cosmic powers of darkness? Do, Do we believe him? Or do we think that our battle really is just with flesh and blood? Have things really changed all that much? I don't think so, friends. Have you watched the news lately? The powers, the authorities, right is called wrong, wrong is called right. The way and the truth no longer matter to many people. What else could we call this but a spiritual battle? And yet, what preparations are we making for this battle? Because if we take it seriously, if you you take the battle seriously, you must take your preparation seriously, right? And certainly the preparation that we give to our children. Should we be vigilant, or should we just bury our heads in the sand? How will we stand against these threats? Are we ready for what's coming? If we're going to be ready, we need to put on the whole armor of God, as Paul tells us. So look with me. We're going to walk through this text and just talk a little bit about the different parts here in Ephesians 6. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Right away, we're reminded that to stand against these powers, to stand firm in your faith against all that is against you and against Christ and his truth, where is that strength going to come from? It's not going to come from you. It's not going to come from me. It's going to come from whom? The Lord. Continuing on here. Put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. The armor of God. What is that exactly? What's his word? 
you remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil? What was his weapon? Did he get out a sword and fight him? No, he defended himself with the word of God. Continuing on in verse 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Paul reminds us that our struggle is not against human opponents, but against spiritual forces of evil. And this is where Christian education comes in. It helps us to recognize the true nature of this battle. It's crucial, crucial that our children understand that life's challenges often have a spiritual dimension, that they are not alone in facing those challenges. And finally, take up the whole armor of God. The importance of putting that on. To have a defense. God does not just leave us out there to suffer attacks without any kind of defense. He gives us defense. He gives us his word. He gives us his sacraments. As we continue on here, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation. The belt of truth. That's the foundation of knowing who God is through his word. And that has to be taught. It has to be taught and learned. The breastplate of righteousness. Living a life that reflects Christ's righteousness. Shoes of the gospel of peace. Being ready to share the good news. Being ready to spread the good news. The shield of faith. Trusting God in all circumstances. That when these schemes come at you, when these lies come at you, you have a defense. The helmet of salvation. Assurance. Hope. Knowing that Jesus wins in the end. Knowing that you have been saved and redeemed by Christ. The sword of the Spirit. Using God's word to counter the lies. We're not just called to a defensive position, but also an offensive position. Not simply to take the hit, but also to counter it with God's word and the truth. And finally, in verse... 18, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. Prayer has to be constant. How are we going to fight against these things? How are we going to stand against these things? Without prayer. Without being connected to God. Giving things to Him and receiving things from Him. And then finally in verse 19, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Boldness to proclaim the gospel. What does all this have to do with Christian education? We have to be properly equipped. And there's two sides to this. You know, we, we pick the sermon hymn, Let Children Hear the Mighty Deeds, because our focus is on our children, bringing up a new generation to believe and confess what we believe and confess. But the other reality is you cannot give out what you do not have yourself. And what that means is that sharing Christ with the next generation does not mean dropping them off at Sunday school and going out to breakfast. Right? It means living a faith that shows in all kinds of different aspects of your life. Letting church be the pinnacle, perhaps, or, or one place that you know you will hear this and your children will hear this. But this should not be the only place that they hear these things. Let them hear. Let them hear the mighty deeds. So, I do have a little confession to make to you this morning. That gets your attention, right? I was up kind of late last night watching Virginia football, and I thought 
I'd be okay because the kickoff was at six, and usually it's three, three and a half, maybe four hours game, so I figured I'll be done by 9, 30, 10 o'clock. What I didn't anticipate was the rain delay that went for a couple of hours and pushed it back. But what that did give me is the opportunity to think a little bit about how that could relate to our message this morning. Because what I saw when I was watching the game was the connection that I had with my kids, the connection I had with the school. And then as they looked out at the crowd, I could see the connections that people in the crowd had with one another. And so first I could remember my own experiences at the school, remember going to the games, and remember being in the band and being on that field, and I could tell my kids about that, and I could explain the game to them and what's going on. And my hope is that they'll grow to love the team the way that I do. And then the team has its own rituals, right? There's songs that they sing, and, and um, a lot of times they'll bring out past teams that have been champions, right? So they, they'll bring them out and put them on the field. And the idea is that if we don't do this, someone's going to forget, right? A lot of people, when they bring these uh, teams out, a lot of people don't even know who they are. And so they have to remind you. And they say, look, we're going to put this out in front of you so that you can remember. And then sometimes they'll retire a jersey. And those are like the saints, right? These are people who have done such amazing things that can never be repeated. And so we're going to retire their jersey because no one else should ever wear it. All of this is part of the game. Can we treat our faith that way? Can we love our faith that way? Can we love our church that way? Because at the end of the day, I don't care that much whether my kids love Virginia football or not. That is not of eternal consequence. I do care that they love the Lord. I do care that they want to be on Christ's team. It was beautiful to see multiple generations out in the crowd. You could tell grandpa and grandson and kid in the middle, and they're all decked out in their gear. Our faith should be the same way, more so. This is what we should be doing with our children when it comes to their faith. Let them hear the mighty deeds that God has done. Most importantly, let them hear about their salvation in Jesus Christ. Let them hear about our great champion, Jesus, who went into battle for them and for us and emerged victorious. Let them hear about how Jesus resisted temptation, how Jesus healed the sick and raised the dead, how Jesus gave himself up for them and for us, how he died for their sins and rose from the grave. And yes, I stayed up late watching Virginia football last night, but you know what else I did? I came to church the next morning. You know who else is here? My kids. What would it say to them if I had said, you know, you guys were up late watching football with Dad. You can sleep in this morning. What priority would I be communicating to them? No, instead it's, yeah, you can stay up a little bit, but you're going to get up for church, right? Because this is the most important thing that we do. Let the children see that faith matters to you. And if you don't have children in the house, there are children in your sphere of influence, whether they're grandchildren or nieces or nephews or somewhere. You have children in your sphere of influence. Let them see that your faith matters to you. And it will matter to them because they love you and they respect you. Let them hear the mighty deeds. To pour out into them, you must be filled yourself. Do daily devotions with your family. Enroll in an adult Bible study this fall. Listen to godly podcasts when you're driving around. And if you want recommendations, ask me. I can make those recommendations for you. Sing hymns and worship songs with the little ones in your life. Let them hear what God has done for them in Christ Jesus. Let them take up the armor of faith. I'm going to do a little exercise with you. Would you turn with me to your sermon hymn, 867? We're just going to speak this together. We're going to read this sermon, I mean this um, hymn together. We're going to speak it together. Because I think this is a good rallying cry for us as we look forward to the fall. Would you say it with me? Let children hear the mighty deeds 
which God performed of old, which in our younger days we saw, and which our parents told. So make to them his glories known, his works of power and grace, and will convey his wonders down through every rising race. Our sons and daughters we shall tell, and they again to theirs, that generations yet unborn may teach them to their heirs. O oh, teach them with all diligence the truths of God's own word, to place in him their confidence, to fear and trust their Lord, to learn that in our God alone their hope securely stands, that they may never doubt his love, but walk in his commands. That's what it's ultimately about. It's not just about them making good choices, although we want them to make good choices. It's about where their hope is found. That when they face these challenges, when they are in these spiritual battles, when they feel despondent and lonely and hopeless, they remember what you taught them. They remember that their hope is in Jesus Christ, that he is victorious over death, that he loves them and cares for them and nourishes them and feeds them and will never depart from them. They can stand firm in their faith and stand firm against the schemes of the devil because you've taught them that. You've given them the gifts of baptism, brought them to Holy Communion, given them all the tools they need so that when that hour comes, the Lord says to them, well done, good and faithful servant. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.